I wanted us to, to stop for a moment and I wanted to ask you if you have been hesitant to give your two mites to the Lord. Do you remember the Bible says that Jesus was standing by the treasury and um, there at the temple they had a large offering box as you, before you went in and you would put your offering in that, I suppose going in or coming out, whatever you preferred. And Jesus happened to be standing with his disciples in some distance and, and to s near it. And a poor, poor widow woman came and she dropped in two mites. We would maybe say two pennies. And Jesus said this astounding thing. He said, do you see that? She has dropped in more than them all. Even those rich men that gave so much because she gave all she possessed, even though it was only two mites. And tonight, you and I might think, I have so little to give to the Lord. Why should I even bother to give it? It's so little. It, it, what will it even do in God's kingdom? I have few giftings, or I have few opportunities, it seems, or I have whatever we may think is small. But, oh, I must tell you, if you give your all to the Lord, he knows and he said that you have given more than the one who has given great wealth to God. And you and I remember that when God took the little boy's lunch, <laughs> it was ridiculously small, but he gave it all. That's all. He just gave it all. And Jesus took it and blessed it and broke it. And it fed thousands. So may we tonight say, Lord, I'm not worried on the amount that I am able to give to you. But I'm going to make sure I give you my all. And that will be great. God would do great things. Anyway, that was a little extra I felt like the Lord would have for somebody tonight. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, tonight, once again, we stand in awe of you and in awe of your holy word. Oh, Father, so much awe. That every day as we open it, once again, our hearts are touched and broken. Our hearts are stirred. Lord, they're encouraged and excited and life enters them again because of who you are and your love for us and what you have spoken and what you are going to do. And so tonight we ask you for these words of your word that we will see tonight. Oh, Father, give us understanding. I'm asking that you would meet us tonight in a new way, oh God, that our lives would be changed. We would step up, oh Father, to a new place in you because we have received your word. We have stored it in us. We have held on to it tightly. And now it is ours. Jesus, the word of God, is ours. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pull this screen back a little bit. There, I can see it better. Tonight, we're going to ask ourselves this question. Maybe you can even say it with me. Am I holy? Do I live a holy life? What does God say about that? Well, in 1 Peter, the first chapter, in verse 15, he says this. As he who has called you is 
holy, so you be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, that means God already said it. Be holy, for I am holy. In first P second Peter chapter 3, he says this. The day of the Lord, and we had to give context to the last part, so we included the verse um, the first part of the verse. It says the day of the Lord, and that's when Christ returns, he will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. You remember God's word said he's going to bring judgment on this earth and he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And it says the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. And the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Then he says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved. What manner of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Second Timothy also speaks of holiness where he says, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling. So here's the question. What is holiness? What is it? I love when God defines it for me. Because then I don't have to make it up or suppose or try. And so God did. And he all, you know, he, he, God discloses these things in scripture, sort of interweaving them. And as we read and, and as his Holy Spirit teaches us, he causes us to see. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 7, God says this. God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Oh, that clarifies some things for us. It helps us know that these two are antonyms. They're opposites. God hasn't called us to uncleanness, but he's called us to holiness. He teaches us this same truth in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. And we're going to go back here for a moment and see the context of this because it's very wondrous and very exciting. But in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, he says, having these promises, beloved, that means you are dearly loved. Having these promises, you who are dearly loved, and we're going to find out what those promises are in a minute, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Now, we're going to learn about that a little later. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Aha. Filthiness uncleanness, cleansing ourselves so we can perfect holiness. Ah, we see that uncleanness, God's word teaches us, is such a big deal because uncleanness defiles us. Go ahead, yes. Uncleanness defiles us. It mars or sullies or spoils or pollutes. It's sort of like, well, COVID is a good thing, right? If we've been in contact with someone who has, who has COVID, suddenly we are defiled, aren't we? We are not allowed then to go back as though we never touched 
that unclean thing because now we're defiled. We have to wait out until we know we're clean again. I was thinking when we have a beautiful glass of water, ha, ah, pure water, and then someone takes their shoe off, picks a little piece of mud off it, just a little one, and drops it in the glass of water. Maybe because I had five boys, I would say something like that. <laughs> what happens? Suddenly, that water becomes defiled. Now, listen here, it's 98% pure. Nope, it's now defiled because something unclean is a part of it. When you and I are defiled, by sin, or we're going to look and see the things that make us defiled. When we are, we can't just go on as though things are the same. Just like we said when we come in contact with COVID, because that's the big deal now. We can't just say, oh, let's just pretend it never happened. We're defiled. Yes. As you and I go back for a minute, to where God said, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Look what he said in the verses leading up to that verse. And I'm going to try to go through them very, very quickly. So I pray you'll be able to come with me. He says here, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, many people say, just say that's a marriage. But lo, look what he says here. He says, because what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? And he says, and what communion, heart to heart fellowship, does light have with darkness? We have to go in the dark. Because they're not going to come into the light, God's light. We have to go in the dark to fellowship or to commune there. He says, and why, what harmony does Christ have with things of Satan? This word is belial, which meant things that have no eternal value. They're earthly. They're wasted. They're going to be burned up. And he says, and what part does he that believes with faithless things? He says, you're going to live in things outside of faith? And he went on to say the fifth thing. What agreement? Oh, we agree. Does the temple of God have with idols, God replacers? We don't need God in our lives. We have money. We have entertainment. We have this. We have that. He says, oh, what agreement is there? And then he says this. For you, you are the temple of the living God. He said, just as God already said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God. What's a God? The only one capable of meeting every need of my spirit, soul, and body. He said, I will walk in you. I will dwell in you. And I will be your God. And you will be my people. And he says, so because of that, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. And don't touch the unclean thing. What happens when we touch something? COVID. We're unclean. God says when you touch those things, unrighteousness, darkness, things of Belial, of the world, of idols, of faithlessness, and you, and you touch them, you're yoked to them. He says, wait. You're unclean. But I want to walk in you and dwell in you. I want to be your God. Not, 
He said, and I want you to be my people. And then he says this, if you don't touch the unclean thing, I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and my daughters. And then he says the verse we read, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having these promises, you who are dearly loved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. A beautiful understanding, a beautiful explanation for us. Yep, when we're defiled, <laughs> just like when we touch COVID and up, oh, we've been with somebody has COVID, we're suddenly defiled. It's a quick parable that helps us grasp it quickly. When we are defiled, we can't just go on and leave things as they are. In fact, in the Old Testament, did you know God spent chapters and chapters and chapters teaching his people what was unclean? Can you imagine? Now, we know back then it was a physical kingdom. God's kingdom was the land of Israel. It was a physical kingdom. Jesus said now his kingdom, he says the kingdom of God in Luke 17, 21, it dwells within you. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a land area anymore. But God in his great wisdom, he taught them how to be clean and what defiled them. He taught them what animals they shouldn't eat that they would be defiled. He taught them if they had contagious diseases and they didn't know about germs, but God did. So he taught quarantine before man ever knew it because he knew about germs. He taught about moral purity so their society wouldn't just, families wouldn't be a mess and uh, a terrible, dark thing. He taught about moral purity, sexual purity, many, many things he taught. And then of course he also taught about the holiness of the sanctuary, not that he dwelt in them, but he said, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you when they came out of Egypt. So, then after he taught them what was clean and what was unclean, then he spent chapters teaching them how to get clean for each one of those things that defiled them and made them unholy. And this is what he said in Luke 15, 31, concerning the seriousness of this procedure of not being defiled and then just walking out and saying, oh, never mind. Let's just go on like before. This is not something I need to worry much about. Right? He says in Luke 15, 31, this is how you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness. These chapters and chapters and chapters of all teachings. And of course, now they're, they, they, they teach great things of hygiene and health, food, healthy foods and all such things. But he says, you shall separate the children of Israel by these things from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness. How? When they defile my tabernacle that is among them. He said it again in Numbers chapter 19 and verse 20. He says, but the man who is unclean, he's touched something unclean, he's eaten something, he's touched the dead, he's whatever, oozing sores, something, he's unclean. And he does not purify himself. This is something he had to choose to go through the process to be clean again. Whatever God had set up. Of course, in his wisdom. But he's unclean, but he doesn't purify himself. That person shall be cut off from among the assembly. Why? Because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of purification 
has not been sprinkled upon him. Did Jesus speak about defilement? Is that just like an Old Testament thing? Yes, he did. In Matthew 15, Jesus said this, the, the things which proceed out of the mouth and come from the heart, they defile a man. And then he went on to say, see, because now God's kingdom is within us. Remember back when it was Israel that was the kingdom of God, it was a land area. God only built, had them build the tabernacle with the holy altar and the holy incense and the bread, the holy table for, for to put the holy, the show bread on. And every, the altar was holy and the priests had holy garments for this sanctuary. But now, no, 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 we are the temple of God. And the holy God dwells within us. He has caused us to be born of his Holy Spirit. And we are his temple. We are his sanctuary. And here Jesus said, these are the things that defile us now, that we have to be cleansed. We have to go through the process until we're clean. He says things like evil thoughts. Did you and I realize that the Holy Spirit? No, oh, evil thoughts. I have to go through the cleansing process if I would be holy again. And he went on, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, faults, witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, God also spoke to us there. He said, don't you know? Now you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now we understand that holiness today under our covenant that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ, this covenant of oneness where he's the head and we're the body. Holiness encompasses, catch that next one, my spirit, my soul, and my body. Here's our question then. How can I be cleansed? How can I be cleansed? Well, the Old Testament uh, cleansing required one or both of the following. Washing with water. And um, so they weren't to enter the sanctuary of the Lord. Some of the things, they even had to be outside of the camp of God's people. Of course, you know, because God blends all in their hygiene and, and his wisdom of everything. But again, it's a picture of now what we, what we have spiritually, right? And so they, they had to wash their bodies, their clothes with water if they had touched a dead person or if they had touched an animal that had died you know, probably because of disease or many things God taught them. And they had to wash their clothes and wash their bodies with water. And many times they also had to bring then, once they did that, and sometimes there was a time frame, sometimes three days, sometimes seven days, whatever, because God knew about germs. And um, so after that period of time, then they had to bring a blood sacrifice to make this thing right with God to be clean, to be forgiven before him. 
What does that mean for you and I? Does the New Testament speak of these things? Of course it does. Go to that next one for me. This is what he says. Number one, we must be washed with the washing of water of the word. Do you remember he taught us about that? Ephesians 5, he says, Christ loved the church and he gave himself for her, right? To make us his own, to enter this covenant with us. That he might sanctify, whoops, go back one, sanctify and cleanse. Sanctify means to make us only his, right? And cleanse her. How? Cleanse with the washing of water by the word. When we allow the word of God to cleanse us, to cleanse, we say, oh God, I see. I need to part ways with this. I hear what you say, oh God. By the power of your living word, I see. First Peter 1.23 says, we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, imperishable seed. The word of God that lives and abides forever. Yes. Jesus said his word abides in us. It has the power to cleanse. And then he said in verse 27 or 26, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not a solid one. No. Oh. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Secondly, Jesus said this beautiful thing in John 15 too. He said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you the washing of water by the word causes us to be clean but secondly you and I know that the blood of Jesus Christ his atoning blood is necessary for forgiveness before God for my sins to be blotted out right the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin and here he says go to the next one he says this there in 1 John 1, 6 and 7, he says, if we say we have fellowship with him, that I'm a temple, I'm a Christian, I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the head and I'm his body and we walk in fellowship. He says, and we walk in darkness? It says, we lie. And we are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we walk with Jesus. And you know what the light does? It discloses everything. It causes us to see that nothing can be hidden, buried, uh, not seen. So when we walk with the Lord Jesus in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, unbroken fellowship with Jesus and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. It's not a past tense. It means right away we're going to say, oh, oh, Lord, yes, I shouldn't have said that. Forgive me, Father, forgive me. Maybe we have to say to that person, I'm very sorry, forgive me. Ah, right away there's cleansing, isn't there? Because we were in the light and nothing was left behind. God longs, like we said, for us to perfect holiness because he now dwells within us. And if we go back, we remember that he said that as we look from 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, where he says, oh, and there it is. He says, having these promises, remember that he would be a God to us and he would be a father to us and he would walk in us and he would dwell in us. Remember, he says, having these promises, you who are dearly loved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. What's flesh and spirit? 
What does he mean? Cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Well, let's look for a minute. We know that the flesh is my sinful nature. In fact, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, just downright tells us the works of the flesh, my sinful nature, who I naturally am without Christ, because all have sinned. We're sinners. We're born in sin. We don't even have to try to sin. You see that tiny little six-month-old baby have an anger problem? Nobody taught them that. They're born in sin, right? We're naturals. And it's only by having new spiritual life that we can ever rise above our fallen nature. Only God's life in us. But he says, so the works of my flesh, my, just my natural man, my sinful nature, are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Quite interesting what these all deal with. It must be very important to God. Idolatry, replacing God. Sorcery, hatred, contentions, arguing a lot. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, self and selfish ambitions, and the list actually goes on, but I didn't have room. He says, as we perfect holiness in the fear of God, he wants us to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Ah, those things filthiness of the flesh. He leaves it up to us, right? Cleanse ourselves. Just like the person in the Old Testament who had leprosy, but they could see they had gone to the priest and the, and the, and the, and the priest said, okay, I see you're well. Then he had to go and do wash his clothes and wash himself and bring us an offering. And he, 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 it was a choice for him to make. And these are things that God says, you take the steps to separate them and come and allow my spirit, my Holy Spirit to live in you. And again, that's a that's a learning thing. We have a devotional tomorrow morning that will talk a lot about that on our Facebook page. A little fun hint there. But secondly, what then is filthiness of our spirit? He said, I, wanted, I want you to take care of both. Well, you and I remember that when we said yes to Jesus, when we received forgiveness of sins, and the Bible says the only way we can enter God's kingdom now is to be born again of God's spirit. That's the only way. There's no, like, not another door to get into God's kingdom now. The kingdom of the Old Testament, you know, there was borders all around. You could just walk in. But Jesus said, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. Born again of what? Of God's spirit. We repent of our sins. The powerful blood of Jesus, and, and I'm willing to part with him. I can't ask him to forgive me and keep him. <laughs> That's not repentance, right? But if I repent of my sins... I will receive God's Holy Spirit. I'll be born again. Jesus come into my heart. And the Bible says God puts his spirit in me. And that's when my spiritual life begins. That's when I have new birth. That's when I begin as a baby in Christ. And I begin to grow, 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 grow. And the Bible says when I say that, when I say yes to the Lord, yes, Jesus. The Bible says this is a covenant relationship. Jesus said this is the new covenant. It's not like the Old Testament covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. He says now, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. One spirit. So, whenever then I do things that now that I'm one with Jesus, and I do things, I'm going to watch this movie, but the Holy Spirit of God, he ain't coming. Because it's not holy. So you know what we do? We say, see you later, Jesus. 
and we go and we do and we fellowship with unrighteousness or whatever it is, and we finish committing spiritual adultery, and then we say, oh, Jesus, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And this is what we say. Forgive me for all my sins. Sorry about that. I wonder in a marriage relationship if that would work. The spouse says, goodbye, I'll be back later. <laughs> kissy, kissy, kissy. And then, oh, I'm back. Oh, dear, how are you? You know, sorry about that. <laughs> Do we think that it's like that with Jesus? Do we think that our walk isn't vibrant and powerful? That we don't contain the power of God's spirit and that unitedness of God dwelling in us? Maybe it's because we're so unholy and we give him a bunch of sorry about that. But it's not right. It, it, things aren't patched up. We haven't taken their phone number out of our phone because we plan on maybe tomorrow going back. And if I feel like it tomorrow, I'll do it again. And I'll do that unholy thing, and I'll have this unholy thing in my life, and this. And when I lay my head on my pillow, I'll say, Jesus, sorry about that. Forgive me if I have any sins. No. This is a covenant relationship. Jesus gave all himself to you. He belongs to you completely in a covenant. He's your head. He's one with you. And when we offer him anything less, it's as disgusting as a spouse who lives an unfaithful life. The relationship's not going to be much of anything. And so he says, we have to not only cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh. We've got to part ways with these. But he says, you've got to part ways with filthiness of the, of the spirit. Or my spirit fellowships and things where God isn't. And here he talks about it in James 4, 4. He says, can you believe this? God calls it what it is. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses. He's talking about spiritual adultery here. That I'm one with the Lord, but not when I did this. Not when I watched that. Not when I went there. The Holy Spirit didn't go. He said, you adulterers and adulteresses. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Oh, we can walk in the world as a dynamic witness filled with Jesus' spirit. We can go in the darkest places and the ugliest places because Jesus and I are walking as one. We can minister there his life and his truth Oh, absolutely. But fellowship with the world, unrighteousness, commune with darkness, be a part of faithlessness? No. And he says, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. A powerful statement for us. <clears throat> Lastly and quickly, let's close with this. Why is holiness so powerful? And of course, we do know why. Just we can conclude why holiness, being consecrated to the Lord, and he said, in all your conduct. It's a walk with God. It's everything I do. It's everything in my heart. It's every part of my life. We walk in a fellowship and a oneness with the Lord that he has his way in us. That we're holy as he is holy. Right? But here's what he says is why holiness is so powerful. In Romans 6, 22. I need you to hit that next one for me. He says this, 
Now being made free from sin. How were you and I made free from sin? Jesus died. It was his death, his atoning blood that alone had the power to break sin's power and penalty over me. Yeah, this is not like a whoop de doo matter. This is a pricey thing. But he says, now you're free from sin. I dwell in you. And then he says, and having become servants to God. Yes, now I'm doing his will. Not my will. I'm, I, I'm crucified now. That's dead. Jesus died for my sinful nature. And I'm not doing the will of the world. I'm a servant to God. And then he says, The fruit from these two things is holiness. That's the fruit of being free from sin and being a servant to God. The fruit from that is holiness. And now look at this. And the end of that is everlasting life. What is that? Oh, don't tell me heaven. No, the Bible says God brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Immortality is when we go to heaven. The life of Jesus is right now. He said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. It says when we carry about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, it's so that the life of Jesus will be manifested, will be seen in clarity in these mortal, in this mortal flesh. Yes. And so the fruit of holiness is that we are carriers of the very life of God. Because he said, I will dwell in you and I will walk in you and I will be your God and you will be my people. If you come out from among me, don't touch what's unclean. That's what he said. Also, oh, yes, the next one. Holiness leads to the power of God's life in us. I remember as um, a young girl belonging to a Pentecostal church. And uh, do you know, the Pentecostal churches 50 years ago were the little churches in the storefront on the other side of the tracks. Because we had just sort of come, the Holy Spirit had just been poured out, and we were the new ones. The big established churches were on this side of the track with the big beautiful buildings, and, the, and they still preach the gospel, but you know what? They didn't really think holiness was important. But the weird folks across the tracks in the holiness church, you know, they were the weird ones that were holy, 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 holy. We were the holy ones, the weird ones. We didn't fit in. And you want to know something interesting? When the people over on this side of the tracks needed a touch from God's life, his power, they couldn't find it there. They came to the little people on the other side of the tracks who were weird and living holy lives. Because God's power was there. Do we wonder why the church of God, maybe when needs are brought, there's little power? Because God's church is not holy anymore. Holiness is despised and mocked or called legalism. But he says, the end of holiness is the life of God. Eternal, everlasting, it means, it means it will continually flow. It's not intermittent or changing. Everlasting life. Also, it's a beautiful thing. Deuteronomy 28 tells us another powerful thing that God promises to a holy people. 
He says, the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. Can we say that? The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. I think we should say it again. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. One more time. The Lord will establish you a holy people to himself. Just as he has sworn to you. If. You keep the commandments of the Lord your God and you walk in his ways. The next verse. Then this is what will happen if we are holy people and we will walk in his ways. Then all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord. And they'll be afraid of you. They have power that all our religiosity, all our biblical knowledge. Or all our worldly enchantments and power and money. No, we don't have that power. And next, and the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body and in the increase of your livestock and the produce of your ground in the land which the Lord swore to, of, to your fathers to give you. Blessing comes from holiness. And next, and the Lord will open to you his good treasure. The heavens to give rain in your land in, your, in its season. Yes, he'll pour out his spirit on a holy church. And to bless all the work of your hand. Because you're a holy people. And you will lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And next he says, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and you are careful to observe them. Yes, God says he's called us to holiness. In closing, Ephesians 1.4 says this. He has chosen us in him. He says, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. He chose us to be holy. Are we offering him everything else? Are we so, so defiled by all kinds of things, flesh or spirit, whether it's fellowship with the world or f fleshly things in us? But we just walk down the aisle and we sit down. We mustn't. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Let's pray together.